it's time to have an uncomfortable discussion. A discussion that is by now far overdue and it involves the extinction of our human civilization as we know it. Yes, a Gen Z kid is here to talk to you about climate change. <laughs> We've all heard of it. Many of us have different opinions on it, but I'm here to talk to you about how climate change and the ecological crisis cannot be discussed and dealt with as a matter of opinion any longer. Over 11,000 world scientists have sat us down and told us that we are in a state of emergency. A 16-year-old girl has started a global revolution of skipping school on Fridays, sitting in front of government buildings, and striking for the climate. There have been millions of people leave their schools, workplaces, and homes to partake in mass global climate demonstrations. And we are waiting for everyone else to join us. The rest of the world needs to listen, and the rest of the world needs to change. We need to put pressure on politicians and world leaders to finally enact strict legislation and set greenhouse gas emission reduction rates. Large corporations can no longer get away with spewing massive amounts of greenhouse gases into our atmosphere, polluting our air and polluting our water. Short-term economic gain can no longer be put over the value of a human life and the value of a natural environment. We are in the midst of the next mass extinction. The sixth mass extinction that all of Earth under recorded history is experiencing, and I say experiencing because it's already begun. Our human actions are showing that species are going extinct at a rate up to 1,000 times higher than what the fossil record has shown as normal. We are shaping our own destinies with the lack of change within economics, politics, and general lifestyles. We are in a mass extinction that is rapidly accelerating and there are still people out there who refuse to believe that it is happening. And this is something that I do not understand. Is it because the lack of transparency within our general lifestyles? Or is it simply as simple as people just denying the, the science behind it? There are a variety of answers to the questions on why people do not believe that the ecological crisis is happening and that the mass extinction we are faced with can eventually get us as humans too. But I am not here to hypothesize and think about why people still don't understand that scientists have a 95% confidence rate and that what we are seeing today as the climate and ecological crisis is a direct reflection of human action. I am just here to share some facts. I am here to increase transparency, and I am here to talk about how my generation is inheriting a crisis that has been in the making since the Industrial Revolution. And I am here to talk about how this is a generational issue, and how it is unfair that as youth, as the younger generations, we have to skip school, we have to take to the streets and fight global politics, and it's unfair because we are thrown into a, gener into a generational issue, into a crisis that is our responsibility to fix when many people in the youth movement cannot vote or they, cannot, or they are not old enough to hold public office. One of the general arguments I've personally heard as a student who is studying sustainability and climate science is from people of the older generation when we have conversations about it. I've been told that as a young person, yes, this crisis is my generation's problem to solve. <laughs> oh my goodness. <laughs> they must agree with me. <laughs> I've been told that every generation has inherited the problems of those who have retired and that my generation is inheriting these problems and we have to push forward because this is how it's always been. But to me, that's unfair. And don't get me wrong, I'm well aware of the generations that have had to pick up large messes from those left before them. But it is unfair because with the ecological crisis we are seeing today, we need to act now and we cannot wait for the general aging process to continue for young people to take on the responsibility when everybody, no matter their age, should be chipping in to help right now. The impacts of climate change and the ecological crisis are actually being made more apparent every single day, and they impact people who may already be struggling. It is statistically proven that indigenous peoples, young children, 
and people who live in low-income communities are disproportionately impacted by the climate crisis and the ecological crisis. In fact, those who I've just named do the least to contribute to the effects of climate change, but they are the most affected by it. And for the children, how is it fair for them to grow up in a world of economic downfall, political instability, food shortages, water scarcities, and, de and collapsing ecosystems? How is it fair for them to grow up in a world and be expected to implement these changes on an even shorter time scale if we do nothing right now? Because the impacts from climate change are accelerating every single day. And how is it fair that as children, we were taught in schools about recycling. We were taught the general science behind what is going on. We read books about pollution. We had Wally. -E. We had Wally. -E. We grew up watching these movies and learning these stories. The climate crisis is happening. Global warming is real. And how is it fair that after being taught all of that, we are still thrown into a society, a capitalist society, that has no environmental accountability at the industrial level. And to me, the answer to these questions on whether it's fair or not is quite simple, because it isn't fair. And as a young person who was on the fence about starting her own family, because what we are seeing every day and what we will see down the road, if we do not get this under control, it's terrifying. Oh my goodness, I knew that would happen. Pardon me. I am just one of the 60 million and counting, well, actually over 60 million kids within Generation Z. The age ranges for both millennials and Gen Z is not super exact, but for Gen Z, it mainly starts at 1997. Millennials mainly start at 1981, and they go through 1996. So right now, the oldest millennial is 38 years old. In 2017 to 2018, the average age of the members of the House in the United States of America was 57.8 years old. The senators came in at an average age of 61.8 years old, and the president, of course, as of 2019, is 73. I'm not going to get into statistics about the rest of the world and their public office positions, but just know that for the most part, it does not even begin to fit in the average age of the millennials. And again, a lot of people who are still part of Gen Z, younger than me, we're not eligible to run for public office, and some of us can't vote yet. I am currently 21 years old. I was born in 1998. I'm still in university. I haven't gotten my bachelor's degree yet. I'm not exactly sure of what I want to do with the rest of my life, but I do know that it does involve solving problems associated with the climate and ecological crisis. If I were to get into politics, and if I were to take a position within the next 10 years, if I were to get elected, I would most likely still be in a political environment with long terms of service. I would most likely still be up against people who are a lot older than me, people who still deny the science behind this, and I would most likely be up against political or people in public power who accept large amounts of their cam campaign monies from lobbyists that are a part of big industries like big energy. Lobbying is a part of the reason why politicians are hesitant to enact legislation in opposition of those they take money from. And this is a part of the reason why big energy receives such large subsidies. Estimates put US big energy or fossil fuel industry subsidies at roughly $20 billion per year. And while the fossil fuel industries, yes, they provide us with electricity, they provide us with energy, transportation and essentials, all these other things. Well, that's great. We have the resources available to us now where we don't need to use these industries that have negative externalities, and the negatives from these industries outweigh the positives by far. The price of negative externalities associated with fossil fuel use are estimated to have totaled globally to $5.3 trillion in 2015 alone. And like I said, the negative externalities that come with fossil fuel use are not only climate change and the influence on the ecological crisis. Another example of the negatives associated with fossil fuels are the risks that come with production facilities. Studies show that frac and drill sites pollute the air around them. 
They pollute public water supplies, they contribute to habitat loss, and they contribute to erosion. Citizens residing in areas near these frack and drill sites and those employed by the industries are at higher risk of developing respiratory illness and children are among the most susceptible. Exposure to pollutants can also increase neurological problems. You can get cancer. There is an increased risk of pregnant women, or pregnant women having harm to their, to their babies. There's an increased risk of birth defects. We now live in a world where we have multiple sustainable and renewable energy production methods. We have solar, we have wind, we have hydropower, we have geothermal, which is taking heat from inside the earth and generating it into electricity. We have biomass, which is burning wood and crops for energy. And even though biomass pollutes and it's considered a more, you know, not super relevant resource, it is still considered more sustainable than the fossil fuel industries, which is pretty amazing. But not all hope is lost because solar and wind energy jobs were among the top two fastest growing sectors in the country in recent years, and the government still provides direct subsidies to the renewable sector. But the USA currently still only receives about 17% of its energy from renewable sources. Once we do eventually and hopefully get to the point of 100% renewable energy, we still have a ways to go before we have sustainable consumerism. And this is because so much of what we use and interact with daily has roots in the fossil fuel industries or releases large amounts of greenhouse gas emissions. So I would like to try something. Please raise your hand if you eat meat. Raise your hand if you eat dairy or consume dairy, okay. Uh, let's see, raise your hand if you interact with plastic. If you have, your orange juice container is plastic, your phone case is plastic. Keep your hands up if you wear clothing that is nylon, polyester, anything synthetic. Raise your hand. Now, every item I have just listed is either responsible for greenhouse gas emissions or is still rooted in the fossil fuel industries. Plastics are sourced from fossil fuels. Synthetic fabrics are made from fossil fuels. Animal agriculture is responsible for 44% of global anthropogenic methane emissions. Methane is over 30 times more harmful to the atmosphere than carbon dioxide. This means that it's more effective at trapping heat in the atmosphere. And as for industrial agriculture, food travels on average 4,200 miles before it reaches a store shelf. We need to implement more sustainable agriculture methods. We need to implement more sustainable production methods. There is no, there is no reason that we should have a massive island of plastic floating in the ocean because we have the technology to take single-use plastics, break them down, and recycle them into clothing. They can be recycled into furniture. We should not have an economy that is not circular. We have the resources and technology to get 100% renewable energy. We have the resources and technology to take garbage and manufacture it into something useful. We can move to a circular economy and we can take things that are single use and make them infinite and multi-purposed. And again, it is important to realize that climate change is still affecting those today. It's not something that is 10, 25, 50, 100 years in the future, it's happening now. In 2018, there were 17.2 million people spanning 144 countries that were displaced from their homes due to climate change related disasters. The United Nations has estimated that this number will increase between 25 million and 1 billion environmental migrants by the year 2050. Also, by the year 2050, it is estimated that 68% of the global population will be living in cities. Also, by 2050, it's estimated that sea levels will have risen 19 inches. Think about how many cities are in coastal areas. In New York City alone, parts of lower Manhattan sit five feet above sea level. Subway systems are an average of 20 feet underground. Increase or the heightened in sea levels 
and increased effects from climate change and the ecological crisis, this impacts weather and climate patterns. This means we will see more extreme precipitation events. With rising sea levels, extreme precipitation events, we see massive storm surges. Storm surges carry water into the streets. Infrastructure will corrode. Wastewater systems will be completely overwhelmed. And now there is a huge public health concern because if wastewater systems cannot handle what is happening and the runoff from all this, the flooding in cities all across the globe gets into public water supplies, the increase or the chance of somebody coming down with waterborne illnesses from an infrastructure that is not prepared to handle climate change skyrockets. So it is important to note that this is also a global public health concern. It's not just an ecosystem collapse concern. It's not just an economic concern. It's not just an energy problem. It's a public health concern. It is also estimated by 2100, there is an 80% chance our global population will sit at 12 billion people. Think about that. 12 billion people with sea levels expected to rise. There's already 17 million environmental migrants from 2018 alone. And think about how many people we're going to see an increase, a further increase in the percentage of our population living in cities that sit in coastal areas. It's crazy. And the weather impacts that come with this are still extremely severe. We have already seen how, how summer of 2019 was the hottest summer ever recorded. We already know that Chicago had record-breaking days of below zero Fahrenheit temperatures. We already know this. But with an increased population, the increase, the increase in these effects, it's crazy because you are going to see more people fleeing their homes due to climate change disasters. The change in weather patterns is going to increase food shortages. Places that already struggle with water scarcity are now even further thrown into the crisis. They are now even worried, they're worried even more about not having water. Water should be a human right. Everyone should be able to have water. It's, it's not something you can exploit, but still we live in a world where companies can illegal, illegally dump into their water. We, have a, we live in a world, we live in a state where there are areas in New York State that have su suffered with undrinkable water and illnesses from water. And now when you have climate change that's increasing the impacts of drought, now there's just not going to be enough water for people to drink when you have a global population at 12 billion people come 2100. And like I said, September 2019 was the hottest September, the warmest September ever recorded. October 2019 was the warmest October ever recorded. This is only going to increase unless we act right now. When scientists say we need to reduce our greenhouse gas emissions 45% by the year 2030, they don't mean start when 2030 hits. They don't mean that. We need to start now. Because what we want to do is we want to avoid a maximum warming of two degrees, which the IPCC has said is still too crazy. They want us now to reach for a target where the maximum warming level we see is 1.5 degrees Celsius. And even a 1.5 degrees Celsius increase, we will see drastic impacts of climate change throughout the world. But they will not be as bad if we surpass the two degrees centigrade mark. We cannot continue to deny the science behind what is going on here. We are in a crisis, and it is very simple to understand. Our greenhouse gas emissions, our lifestyles, everything we do right now is unsustainable. And today, it is almost impossible to live sustainably. It, well, it isn't impossible to live sustainably, but it's impossible to do it where it, it, it's easy, where it's what our quality of life is at. It's very difficult to live sustainably. And the thing is, when people say, oh, well, you know, the climate's changed before. You know, it's, we've had greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. Yeah, tens of thousands of years ago. And they didn't have cars back then. I'm pretty sure a dinosaur has never driven a car in his entire life. <laughs> because what we are seeing today with greenhouse gas in the atmosphere, scientists have concluded that the processes going on with greenhouse gas release in the atmosphere is not normal. It's anthropogenic. It's created by us. It's created by you, it's created by me. Most importantly, it's created at the industrial level because there's no regulations really set. Again, like I said, my generation is inheriting a crisis that has been in the making since the Industrial Revolution. We're going to have to implement an entirely new economic system, an entirely new way of how we obtain resources that keep our standard of living where we want it to be. 
And that's crazy. And that's not something that can be thrown on an entire generation because the climate crisis is happening now. People are being displaced now. And so when I say it's a generational effort, it is. Because no matter your age, you live on this earth. You should contribute. And that's why you should join the climate movement. Don't let the word youth deter you from joining us. We want you to join in. Because the climate fight, the fight for climate justice, is a fight for social justice. It's a fight for you. It's a fight for you. It's a fight for me. It's a fight for life. So don't let the word youth deter you from this movement. We want you to join us. It doesn't matter what your age is. You need to make contributions now. And we want you to come and join us because we're inclusive. The, this crisis cannot be thrown an entire generation that has people who can't even vote yet. The crisis is happening now. And it's going to continue unless we don't act. And, it's going, and even if we do act 15 years down the road, the effects that come with it are still crazy. So we want to act, and we need to act. And that is why I ask you to join me. Thank you.